welcome to the session. Um, let me also uh, remind everyone about the uh, some of the housekeeping rules that uh, we will be observing during this session. I see more people joining in. Hi, Anne. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Hi Demi Lola. Can we uh, move to the uh, Zoom slides, please? Yeah, please note that this session is being recorded and parts of it will be available on YouTube channel of uh, IID. And also I request all the participants to please do not share the link outside uh, this meeting group. And please close all non-essential uh, applications on your devices, such as Skype. Um, please mute your microphone if you're not speaking. And you can also turn off your video if in case you face any kind of technical uh, problem. And please feel free to uh, respond through the chat box uh, and put, your, put in your comments and questions um, so that we can, uh, we can also uh, make it more participatory. So welcome, welcome everyone again. And uh, now uh, let's just kick off the discussion and try to understand why uh, we have uh, we are having this session and what is that we are trying to achieve through this session. Um, so from our experience, we have seen that uh, communities have years of uh, experience in dealing with multiple crises, and they have the experience of also testing out different solutions which they learn and share with their networks and they build and uh, they teach and learn from each other different strategies and solutions which are also uh, transferred and scaled but despite uh, the community knowledge these um, the communities are not uh, recognized as uh, knowledge holders or experts um, uh, the information collected by communities uh, are also uh, representative of their own uh, priorities and needs. And um, in, a, in, in, in our uh, work, we have seen how communities' knowledge is being used by the government to help in adaptation planning and decision making. Um, in, when we uh, talk about uh, um, innovation, uh, we, we mostly understand it in terms of uh, technological innovations, but uh, innovation can also be process led and uh, it can also mean putting in place some of the uh, relationships that, that help to shift the dynamic be be between different kinds of actors. Um, and uh, as Vairu Commission, we also believe that the empirical knowledge coming from communities must be valued and um, communities must be seen as practitioners who, uh, who always test solutions and bring their strategies to action, which can also be uh, useful for informing climate action and has implications for climate adaptation. So today in this session, we want to hear from the community leaders and NGO practitioners who work with communities about the different kind of research they do, which leads to innovation, and also discuss what we can learn from some of these examples to promote institutional recognition of uh, grassroots communities in urban areas, and also how we can help them to deepen, disseminate, and link communities' knowledge with that of professional knowledge of uh, the practitioners, scientists, and uh, people working in the universities. Um, we have with us very four. We have with us four very experienced and dedicated uh, grassroots leaders and uh, community practitioners who will share their experience and strategies of how they have done community research in their uh, in their work and how they are also using this process to build partnership with the government. And um, this will help us in understanding a little bit about why a community-led data pr process is indeed innovative and transformative. So I would like to invite our first speaker, uh, Veronica Katulushi, who is from Zambia Homeless and People's, uh, Poor People's Federation in Zambia. 
Uh, Veronica is a grassroots leader and national facilitator. She is associated with uh, Viru Commission is all, and also she is a member of the SDI network. Um, unfortunately, Veronica is not able to join us uh, directly today because of some uh, issues, but we have a, a video that we want to show you where she will be talking about the social tenure domain model, which is a pro-poor land information tool that uh, she has used in the community to map the land boundaries. And this is a tool that um, has helped com the different communities to come together. They, they affirm the information through their neighbors and then the information is kind of presented to the government and uh, government accepts this information. So uh, I request uh, Ariana to please play the video for Veronica. Uh, sorry, I'm not able to hear the audio. The social tenure domain model is a tool that is used to map and link people's relationships to their land and their communities, especially the informal settlements. We experience a lot of challenges like flooding, waste, droughts, etc. When we come to flooding, we experience a lot of diseases because of the water, the stagnant water for malaria, the, the, the waste that is accumulated. Now, it is through the social tenure domain model that we capture all these challenges. When we go out in the communities with questionnaires, those questionnaires will guide us on what will come out as priorities within a speculated um, community. We are going to ask the beneficiaries the questions and the challenges that they are facing. Either with the council or the local authorities, we work in conjunction so that they also are able to, cut, to touch what is on the ground, the challenges that the communities are facing. When it comes to land, we use uh, the GPS machine, which will capture the boundaries of uh, the, the beneficiaries. And when do the, we, we do that, of course, we call the neighbors have to be part of the, 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 the people that are monitoring or that are, that are doing the mapping so that they agree to say, yes, this is a bona fide member of or, or the owner of this um, this land. So from there, the data that is collected will go to the local authorities. When it goes to the authorities, the local authorities will put in place because this information has come from the people within the communities, from the grassroots people, and it carries weight because the, the data that is captured is for the people and it will benefit the people. A policy is in place and because of the findings, the challenges that uh, are found there, it will help the government to put in place. Like for, in for instance now, because of the land rubbles, the land issues that were involved in the past, the government now has put in place to say, the women, 50% land has been to be given to the women. 20% has to be given to the youths and other vulnerable people. Which means the STDM or the social tenure domain, has been accepted by the stakeholders and by the government. When it comes to drought, people are made aware, they are sensitized. They have to be in readiness of the droughts that are coming. They are aware of which crops to plant in their fields. What is it that we are going to do when there's a flood? So they are in readiness of all those challenges. This helps to sustain even the livelihoods of the people. Through the infrastructure, they are able now to build even stronger, stronger
stronger structures in readiness because the, 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 the climate has changed. And now how do they adapt to that? When we're talking of uh, sack gardens, the nutritional status, the household, we are encouraging the women to plant sack gardens, even backyard gardens, so that they are able to conquer the poverty levels within our homes. They are able to plant vegetables and sell as income generating activities. So in so doing, we are curbing the poverty levels. When we come to, to waste, which is accumulating in her, there's separation. We separate the waste and that can be sold. Because if we just dump anyhow, we are vulnerable to diseases like diarrhea, cholera, typhoid, and all those disease, uh, the diseases, even malaria, because of the stagnant, stagnant water that is accumulated. So together, the STDM has proved a tool that can be used in the communities. Thank you. Thank you. That was Veronica from Zambia, and she is sharing about the social uh, tenure domain model, which uh, helped them to map land boundaries of the informal uh, settlement communities uh, living uh, in Lusaka city in Zambia, and how uh, this whole process has uh, using uh, using both community mapping and uh, GPS technology, uh, they are able to identify the you know, not only uh, the the land uh, in which they are living, the mapping the boundaries, but also the many challenges that they face, and uh, this has then been accepted by the government, which uh, helped the communities to secure land uh, tenure. Um, and, and that then enables them to uh, look at various options to secure their food, nutrition, livelihoods, and other things. So thank you. And thank you, Sheila and Suranjana also for adding in your comments uh, uh, regarding the context, giving a context to our listeners. Um, we have with us uh, today our next speaker, Christine Mutuku from SDI Kenya. Um, hi, Christine. Uh, Christine is a community organizer and a federation leader in uh, Mungano Wawana Vijiji. And she has been extensively involved in city-led projects that uh, city-led projects and working with the government, which has been um, uh, which which also includes the Mukuru Special Planning Area, which we'll be talking about today. Um, welcome, Christine, and uh, please tell us uh, what kind of information do you collect uh, from the communities? Um, what is really unique about this process and how does it help you to build your relationship with the government? Over to you, Christine. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Christine Mwelu. I come from Kenya in a formal settlement known as Mukuru. And uh, Mukuru is in formal settlement whereby we have faced many challenges through climate change. We have faced flooding. Then after the flooding, this is whereby outbreak of diseases have really risen. Then people are really suffering. We are really suffering out of the uh, outbreak of diseases. Uh, E.g., for example, malaria, we have typhoid, gorilla, and uh, out of that, we, we came and we sit down and said we have to plan for ourselves. Then because Mukuru is a big slum, this time we decided to collect data for ourselves, we community, and the technical people assisted us to collect the information. We are by, we used to provide link forms to write the information that we are collecting from the, from the informal settlement. And we used to also FGD focus group discussion to, to inform the people why we are collecting the information and also the community to talk for themselves, the kind of, uh, struggle that we are going through and the information that we are collecting was um, counting the structures with, which are located in our slums and also taking the total number of people 
uh, who all the talking the number of community uh, families in that area. And also we were using GPS to locate all the facilities which we needed to know they where how many schools we have and hospitals those are examples there are things and also sanitation toilets we want to know how many they are because of the great number of the community uh, when we we when we came to to know why we are collecting the information we wanted to know who are the people living in mukuru and how will they profit from this data and how will we be able to communicate with the government so we we are able to communicate with the government through this data that we collected and we made sure the data was correct for the government to know that the community is fed up with this kind of outbreaks and we needed a change in Mukuru because Mukuru is a private land and uh, we used it to face a lot of eviction, things that uh, sometimes our houses we are touched. So we we are, so we should start. We we are standing firm enough to give our report to the government. And out of the report that we collected, the county government came in. They walked around Mukuru, and exactly they found that the data that we collected it is true. These people are suffering because there are no plan. There is no plan. We could only build the structure wherever you you find us test. So after the county government coming in, that is where they started locating where the roads will go through, although the communities where we are proposing. But when the government came in, they said the proposal of the community was not enough because we needed vehicle inside the community in case so the outbreak of fire in the case of the outbreak of diseases. So they are right now, as I talk, Mukuru was declared to be a special planning out of the effort of the community and out of this challenge of climate change. We are by we as the community or me as a community leading community uh, leader, I'm, I, I was ready to see a change in our community. Challenges, we are there, but where we are, we can say we have seen a change in Mukuru and not even enough change because we are still persisting for the things which we need to be put in Mukuru. Whereby they have set spaces for the hospitals to be built. Well, and in that process, we say, like community, we are happy because the hospitals will be located in Mukuru and people will not be suffering while looking for far and distance hospitals to go. We thank uh, our government because of the struggle of our community that we have done. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. That was indeed very powerful. And it's it's such a great example of how uh, the information collected and organized uh, by communities is helping the government to uh, sort of create uh, opportunities to uh, work in partnership with the communities in, in planning the area where they are living. And in urban settlements, we know that uh, communities are in constantly facing eviction uh, and demolition threats. Um, and and so uh, so when 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 uh, uh, when collecting uh, the information about their different structures and uh, the number of people living uh, in these informal settlements are being taken to the government that sort of provides uh, real data uh, data from real data and then uh, this is this is a way how uh, communities are uh, establishing the relationship with the government and also uh, ensuring that they are included in planning of that area so thank you so much uh, christine uh, for that example um, now let me bring in Sonia Federigo from Philippines. Sonia is a national community leader from the Philippines and has been involved in uh, slum profiling and mapping efforts, some of which has led to inclusive upgrading of slums in uh, partnership with the government. And um, thanks, Sonia, for joining the session today. Um, could you also tell us how, uh, what approaches or tools you use um, while collecting information from the communities and what sort of results, some of the results that you have achieved through this. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sonia from the uh, Homeless People's Federation Philippines. 
and I would like to share uh, some of the experience with the Federation regarding how communities were transformed uh, because of the data that we have gathered. So next slide, please. So if we, you see the context in the Philippines, you are prone to uh, uh, typhoons, landslide, and flooding, and especially in those areas, uh, we call the danger areas or high-risk areas. At the same time, we also face of uh, threat of eviction and demolition, and some man-made hazards like fire, uh, health hazards uh, due to poor sanitation, no access to potable water, proper toilet, and limited access to basic services. So in this is uh, pressing issue that we are facing, the Federation uh, decided to conduct a community-led household survey and also mapping process. Because when you check with the national government, the national government generated data. We noticed that there is a big mismatch and the huge gap uh, regarding the information about the communities. There is no updated data that represents the current numbers and situations of the communities. Uh, so that's why, that's why this is one of the reasons why we have to lead the uh, community-led household survey. And also for our national and global advo advocacy as we are part of the SDI and for community information and monitoring itself. So when we conducted the data to our household survey, we were able to uh, gather information around the tenure status of the community the ownership of the land, the land area, the boundary maps, and also we have conducted settlement profiles. We also have uh, information around number of households, the houses and type of housing structure and materials used, what are the basic infrastructure and services available and lacking in the community. And at the same time, resources available in the community that can mobilize and uh, current plans and opportunities, as well as strategies that can be supported. Because in communities itself, uh, there are a lot of people's plan that has to be supported and ignored by sometimes by the government. Uh, we also uh, I, uh, have information about uh, some locally initiated adaptation strategies that can be scaled up or replicated. So using this data, uh, we engage the city government around the issues of slum upgrading because some of the issues around this um, danger areas is not about resettlement, but some of them only know, needs uh, slum upgrading. Uh, we also engage uh, government around the issue of housing and also the future projects and targeting the these high risk communities. We also use this data information to mobilize and organize communities to into city wide networks and to think of the collective solutions rather than individual solutions. The data also serve as a tool in influencing local development and shelter plans to improve the conditions of uh, especially the disaster prone communities and those facing eviction and demolition threat. We also use the data to explore uh, alternative building materials because you see in the Philippines, the cost of uh, building materials is very expensive and uh, materials that are renewable, affordable and uh, disaster resilience as, as the use of bamboo technology and uh, bricks. We're able to secure uh, land for some families as a result of our data and our advocacy with the government. And we, we always say that we prioritize those families living in danger areas. We, because of our data, we have obtained support from the government for the use of the uh, alternative building materials and, uh, and uh, accreditation for these materials to be used in our housing project. We have institutionalized partnership and influence policies, uh, local government related to issues of land, uh, community upgrading, and disaster intervention as we became member of uh, the government local special bodies. Uh, to name a few, we have the local development council. This is the council where federation sits and uh, this is where development plans and budgets are being presented and approved and we are part of that. We're also part of the local housing board where the policies around housing is being uh, discussed. We also have we are become part of the local shelter plan and the most important thing is that we become part of the local disaster risk reduction management council within the city where disaster intervention mitigation and plans are being discussed together with uh, some stakeholders and uh, academic and the private sectors. So our data made us to become one of the major stakeholders and was involved in the decision making process of the city when it comes to urban development and uh, all issues related to communities and help government to make informed decisions. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Sonia. That was a very uh, fantastic example of community generated information. And um, you have you spoke about uh, having a combination of different tools like mapping each households and what kind of uh, structures are there, what are their different, uh, what the different issues communities are facing. And uh, the, the, some of this information were not available with the government, but your, uh, the, uh, but the data community collected has helped the government in relocating the, these communities and also allocating land. And then you also spoke about um, housing, upgrading uh, housing and using alternative technologies, um, which is also an innovation. And uh, I think um, this, uh, I think uh, th this helped uh, the communities in Philippines to be part of the local decision making. And uh, this sort of uh, also um, gave a basis for the uh, low city level planning in the, for the government. So thank you, thank you for your uh, for sharing your experiences again. Now I would uh, like to bring in um, Matthew Okello from Practical Action. Um, Matthew works with uh, the Practical Action as a area uh, coordinator in the Lake Victoria region, and he has a lot of experiences in organizing and working with uh, communities. Um, welcome, Matthew, and please tell us uh, how do you do research in your community and uh, what is what tools you use and what impact has uh, has this created? Over to you, Matthew. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello to everyone. My name is uh, Matthew Okello, as uh, has been said. I work with Practical Action and its National Development Agency. I am based uh, in Kisumu, and this morning I will be sharing with you experiences from participatory planning, information for dialogue and innovation from Kisumu City in Kenya. Uh, for those of you who already know, uh, Kisumu is the third largest uh, city in Kenya with a population of about 500,000 people. And up to uh, about 60% of this population live in low income settlements or slums, if you like. And these are low income settlements or slums are characterized by poor housing conditions, as you can see on your slide. Low levels of services ranging from limited access to safe water and basic sanitation facilities. The effects of climate change are already evident. And we have seen over the last few years, greater extremes, some months much wetter, others drier. Seasonal flooding is a growing concern. Uh, for many years, decision-making was uh, top-down and local budgets for priority projects have been available, but largely poorly spent to address priority issues affecting the poor. Now, as a result of this, practical action has been engaging with uh, local community groups organized into neighborhood associations. And from the year 2008, we have been working with local organizations, partner national governmental organizations to be able to support participatory planning processes, including mapping or context analysis, ranking risks and problems, identifying key challenges that affect local level development and, and identifying the local people to prioritize some of these uh, solutions. We have been able to identify actors and build relationships with local people as well as external actors so that we could be able to address some of the challenges that affected the local people. And some of the outcomes of these uh, tools that we did use included what we have referred to as strategic local level plans, or if you like, local water development plans, which have been able to feed into the county integrated development plans or annual development plans. One of the things that we have seen is that these 
approaches have been able to build consensus and create space, especially for women and poor tenants, and have been able to engage, have been able to increase the engagement with local government, uh, such as in the preparation of annual development plans, practicing together and bringing their voices to bear on key decision-making plans and budgets. And I want to confirm that we have seen uh, better results through this approach. The neighborhood associations have been able to mobilize local um, actions, including people who live in some of these areas. And we have seen uh, this, especially in the year 2020, when we did experience some of the worst floods. And this was also the year that uh, COVID um, hit hard. And the neighborhood planning associations were not only the first people on the ground to respond, but they were more in terms of identifying the greatest uh, areas that needed to be, for example, opened up. They were able to identify areas that are prone to water logging and were able to support the most vulnerable families to move to higher ground, even as they sought help from uh, local government, um, uh, such as departments of uh, water, departments of health, and other external resource organizations to come to the aid of people who needed uh, the support uh, most. Now, we have realized that for many years, planning was such a professionalized and a top-down tool that did not respond more specifically to the needs of the people who needed it most. And therefore, we have seen that with this participatory planning processes, we have been able to show better outcomes with community leadership, grassroots structures, and people have been able to identify and prioritize local actions that respond better to uh, their situation. We think that in the same manner, climate adaptation suffers more or less the same fate. It is highly uh, professionalized and decision-making again is uh, top-down. We are persuaded that with community leadership for dialogue and uh, innovation, there can be a better outcomes, just like we have seen with participatory planning processes. Uh, that means greater community control over decisions and monitoring of decisions and plans, such as spending of funds for adaptation in urban areas. This uh, might require ongoing life cycle support to neighborhood planning associations to en ensure uh, representation and ability to respond better to some of the challenges that people are struggling with. Thank you so very much. Uh, this is my presentation coming from Kisumu City in Kenya. Thank you, Matthew, for the presentation. Um, I also see Suranjana's comment on, uh, she's saying that um, over professionalizing of planning le often leads to inability of the plan to respond to the needs of those for, who really need development. And I think it is very well demonstrated from your presentation. And uh, you have mentioned about some of the participatory tools that uh, communities are using <laughs> to not only collect information, but also engaging with the wider uh, community stakeholders like the government and informing them about their priorities and um, and this is this has been able to create a space for uh, many poor women and uh, marginalized tenants living in the uh, urban settlements in Kisumu, Kenya. And uh, I think uh, the, the, the process has also generated increased engagement with the government and has, has supported in developing county development plans. So thank you, Matthew, for the presentation. And also uh, thank you to all the speak speakers uh, uh, who, has, who have joined us today. And thank you for sharing in your experiences of the great work that you are doing. And, um, and we really saw a diverse range of approaches that uh, grassroots communities in urban settlements are using to collect information and also uh, how it is helping the government in developing climate adaptation planning and decision making. 
So now then, how do we really strengthen and support community knowledge and research and the efforts that they're putting in? Um, we, uh, we I just want to touch upon a little bit on the innovation, uh, uh, on the kind of innovation also coming out, it's which uh, I earlier mentioned about the process uh, that is innovative in the way communities are able to link to the not only the government, but multiple stakeholders, and uh, where the government is recognizing uh, communities and uh, partnering with them. And also, we saw some uh, technical innovation, as in the case of Sonia, who mentioned about alternative housing or upgrading the infrastructure that is more suitable for uh, uh, climate change and uh, and can uh, and and is uh, and is uh, and it's uh, and it stands strong during uh, climate risk like floods and droughts. Um, so I think now uh, we can move to the next segment of our session, and I would like to uh, invite my co-facilitator Lucy Stevens from the Practical Action. Uh, she is the head of Practical Action Cities Fit for People program, and she will guide us through the next process. Thank you, and over to you, Lucy. Thank you very much, Anwesha. So uh, now we have an opportunity for uh, us all to share our experiences, to discuss um, and engage with each other, uh, because we're going to have uh, a good amount of time for some breakout groups. Um, stimulated by <clears throat> by the uh, presentations that we've had so far. So it's my job now to tell you how that's going to work and some of the questions that we're suggesting that you will discuss. We are going to divide into groups and each of those groups will have a facilitator and a note taker um, who will be able to share some of your points back afterwards. Um, in your group, it will be quite a small group, but if you can agree somebody who would be willing to report back. Uh, when it comes to reporting back, you'll need to just pick two or three key points uh, because you will only have a few, a few minutes to report back um, from, from your group. Really, it'll be a chance for you to, to learn uh, and discuss within the group. We will have about... Um, 25 to 30 minutes um, in the in the discussion groups. I think if we make 25 minutes, that will allow us enough time to uh, hear from the groups afterwards. Um, now, the process, uh, our, our Zoom coordinator, Sohail, is going to allocate people into a room so i'm sure that will all work um, very smoothly so you you will find yourself in a group automatically fingers crossed that works i'm sure if we need to do anything so how will let us know and then you will be returned automatically after the 25 minutes back to uh the plenary okay so what are we going to be discussing you'll have a facilitator in your group but there will be a couple of uh breakout group questions the first, which helped to link us to the theme of the conference and uh, the themes that have been discussed. The first one is, um, we've heard about lots of different community driven data collection tools and approaches. So how can those help in adaptation to climate change? That's the first question. We've seen a few examples of that. So it'll be good to discuss more and hear from you in your, in, uh, in your contributions. The second question is, goes a bit beyond what we've heard, a little bit beyond what we've heard today, but how can the government, institutional partners, researchers, donors, and so on, strengthen and support community-led research for urban adaptation so that uh, this kind of urban adaptation can be a better part of national adaptation plans and so on? So yeah, how can, how can we make that to support work? Also, as part of the breakout group, you can have an opportunity to ask people questions that might have come up for you during the presentation. So do take the opportunity to do that. Don't feel you have to only stick to these breakout group questions. Uh, you may find that you've got questions for the presenters. So please feel free to, to um, go ahead and ask them. Okay, so I think we're ready to split off into our breakout groups. Um, so I think that should, that should be able to happen. 
let us know. Yep. Okay. Right, uh, rooms are ready. I'll be basically putting everyone in them. Thank you very much. And rooms have been opened. You have been invited. Please join in. So when you get a little notice on your screen, you have to click to join. Have a good discussion and we'll see you all at, uh, at the other when we come back to a plenary. Wonderful. Welcome back, everybody. And I hope that you had uh, a very fruitful discussion in your uh, in your breakout group. I'm just going to make sure I can see who has been leading each of those each of those breakout groups so that I can uh, invite people to provide us with some some feedback. We certainly had a very fruitful discussion in our group. Um, so that you don't, uh, I, I will be providing a bit of feedback from our group, but uh, so that uh, we break things up a bit. May I go to the group that was facilitated by Ariana and uh, Zilire to provide some feedback. Feel free to share your notes or, or just to give us two or three points. We will just have to limit you to two or three minutes to share back uh, some of what I'm sure was a very rich discussion. So the uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I was taking some notes um, during that group. Uh, there was a lot of discussion, but I can only mention a few. Um, on the first question, what was mentioned is that it uh, provided good insight in uh, the local level, the challenges that they face and the experiences, and also provide some room for um, uh, what would be the best solutions. It also ensures that it empowers leaderships to the communities and that it provided a platform for dialogue. Uh, some other aspects that were mentioned um, uh, were that the differences in communities that it's important to also pay attention to within that, uh, for that, because uh, communities are not an hom homogenous groups, so that we should pay attention to that. And that we must ensure that the plans that are developed based on the data, that these are up to date, flexible, and um, include the newest strat strategies and methodologies, uh, so that there is flexibility uh, pos possible within the plans for improvement. For the second question, it was mentioned that um, it could help um, let me get back to what the second question was, sorry. Uh, so how could the government and institutional partners strengthen and support community-led uh, research? So what was mentioned that uh, local innovation platforms, which includes government researchers and communities could be helpful uh, in uh, providing new evaluation options and to engage different kinds of stakeholders. Um, that it's uh, important to also ensure that the data is available and that um, it uh, could be uh, disseminated. Um, and that there should be a link between the data and the planning so that we engage in bottom-up planning. Uh, and that we should be careful on how the communities uh, are using the data and options uh, what could also be done is that uh, the institutional donors uh, could provide funding, that um, they, the researchers could uh, help train facilitators in certain methodologies and provide insight in the newest methodologies. And I hope that my group will add to me in the chat box. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Yes, please do add any other points but so that we can capture them in the in the chat box. Uh, I'm if uh, if if there are further points that you that you that really struck you as part of the discussion. Let me pass on to Christine and uh, and Wesha's group, please. Yes, uh, I'll just share my screen so that uh, Christine can present. Sorry. We can we can see that fine if you. Uh, okay. Okay. I mean, yeah. it's not full screen, but it's perfectely fine. So yes, please go ahead. Yes. Oh, there you are. Lovely. Christine. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? 
Yes, yes, please go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm using just a small phone, so I cannot read the, the, the notes. Please just present. Just read the notes, please. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. So mainly, uh, I mean, um, we in the in the, the first question on how community-driven data tools and approaches help in adaptation to climate change, um, we discussed a little about uh, how the community community data collection process really starts, um, how how the community members and leaders they convince and communicate the communities on uh, about the real problems and help them to prioritize what is affecting them and. Uh, the whole process of data collection then uh, sort of empowers them to talk to the government and uh, helps them in negotiating and uh, bargaining resources because they are coming from a point of strength and they talk to the government basis this data and um, also uh, because uh, the, the whole process is uh, both empowering and building the capacities of government. And since it is a community driven process, it is uh, helpful for uh, generating plans that uh, that that is uh, actually used and uh, uh, helpful for the communities. And for the for the second question on how government and institutional partners can really strengthen and support community led research for adaptation, there were mainly two points that came up, which is again related to building um, communities technical capacities to collect and present the information. Um, and, uh, and also putting untied resources at the hands of communities through which they can undertake the research and innovation. We mainly discussed about uh, uh, the resources in the, in the context of uh, communities, in, you know, valuing communities time and efforts for uh, collecting the information and who really uh, compensates uh, them for, for taking up this initiative. So yeah, these are our points from our groups. If anyone wants to add from the group, please do add. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anwasha and Christine. Uh, our next group is uh, Chris and Teresa. Hello, good afternoon. Um, so uh, the so the main points that we have discussed in, in our group um, uh, is just three for the first question. So the first one is that institutions are driven by their policy uh, when it comes to data gathering or research, which is not answering the need of the people. So um, community-driven data is um, more uh, directed to fit for purpose planning. So uh, it can be, uh, so the, the plan would be uh, more relevant to the need of the community. And then the second, community data help, help us know the, the key blockage points and the facilitating factors in, the, the, in, the, in uh, addressing climate change. Like for example, the Ex, uh, the expose the real issues, the real risk, then the gravity of the the situation, the the details of what action needs to be done in the community, and then the third one is that adaptation tools are key to identify which systemic gaps and leverage points for improved tracking of adaptation technologies. So, so this is more of the monitoring side of uh, the, the plans uh, and uh, the strategies that, that were implemented on the ground. Uh, for the second question, we did not really have the time to, to answer, but uh, it, it, we agree to the points that was made by the first group really uh, empowering the community to uh, strengthen them to, you know, their strengthen their capacities to really um, develop this, their skills more and then so that they can, uh, you know, they can really use this as a leverage for the, for the government to, you know, to, to really listen to them and, uh, accept this 
data that this is the, the true data that is provided by the community uh, and this is the actual situation of the area of the of the community so that's it i think if if my group can still add please do so thank you thank you so much uh teresa um i was in the i know we've got one other group I'll just give a short bit of feedback from the group that um, that I was uh, participating in. Um, one of the one of the key points we made is that uh, we know that these that that actually there's a uh, that climate funds and development funds are, are quite similar uh, now. Actually, uh, all development to be good development needs to be conscious of climate issues. So. So uh, we don't need to see a big distinction between these two things and the kinds of issues that are being raised by these sorts of community planning these days are, are, are naturally identifying some of the uh, issues that are really key to adaptation. So because these are things that are on the ground, because they are grounded in reality, they are, uh, they are geared towards um, helping with, with issues of adaptation. Um, uh, and and the, and that and they are crucial because the city doesn't doesn't have um, an idea of the sorts of vulnerabilities, the details of who is affected and how um, on the ground. They often uh, miss out on some very key insights in the absence of this kind of uh, in, uh, disaggregated um, community level data. In relation to the second question. Um, there's a, well, there was a sense of frustration that actually we ha that these kinds of processes have to be justified and reinvented and rediscovered every time, one by one at the city level. Uh, you know, we need to find a way to leapfrog so that these become the norm. We also talked about how they can be institutionalized as part of the ongoing practices within uh, at the city level and how that can be supported. Um, actually, we found that uh, once Kim, once uh, city managers see the value in it it is easier for it to become institutionalized and that value becomes apparent quite quite quickly but also there's a challenge of lots of turnover of uh, of people in leadership roles at the at the city level so um so 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 there needs to be some kind of practicing over time um and a sense that uh, we just need to get over the hurdle where uh, communities are treated as if they won't understand these issues, climate issues, but in fact, they understand the realities of these situations all too well. Let me pass to the last group, which was led by Suranjana and Ruby. Would you like to provide any more feed any of your feedback from your group? Hi, everyone. Uh, we had a really interesting discussion in our group, uh, or rather, should I say, we began to touch on some very interesting points. On the first question um, around um, the, on, on tools, I think we, we had more of a discussion on that re-emphasize the power of community-led data. So uh, people uh, talked about, you know, community-led data reflecting the true realities and the priorities of communities. They talked about the ability to negotiate from a position of strength. They talked about the up-to-date uh, data and knowledge that communities bring in their research. Often researchers are studying uh, material which comes from a fairly long time ago. So this is often real time up-to-date data and um, we also had someone uh, talk about the need to better analyze human animal conflicts and their impacts. Um, regarding how other institutions can help communities to strengthen their work and to leverage their research in ways that strengthen communities. We actually had some terrific insights there. Uh, the first is uh, someone talked about the need to actually document and communicate more the kinds of knowledge and innovation that communities ha already have in place, for example, their own uh, indigenous early warning systems. The second was the idea that 
um, communities need sometimes universities to endorse and legitimize their data and knowledge. And I think sometimes that can be a bit of a double-edged sword, but it's uh, an important thing to think about. And uh, a community leader from Zimbabwe talked about how the local government was far more willing to accept their, the community data when once they had started partnering with the community. And um, uh, the other interesting piece that came out was we had a consultant in our group who said she was very willing to work with local communities who were engaged in urban planning processes to, and use their data uh, you know, in places where she, she was working. And uh, that brought up the issue of do communities have rules and principles about who can access and how they can use their data. And Sonia from the Homeless People's Federation also talked about uh, how the rules they've set up in, uh, in the Philippines and where in which the local government actually has to ensure that the communities are made aware of who's using their data and how they're using it. So I thought that that we started off a really exciting conversation, which is to be continued. Thank you. Thank you. Um, was there any other group um, or have, have we now completed feedback from all of the groups? Is there anyone else who needs to provide feedback? I think I've got the full list, but I just wanted to double check that there isn't anyone else expecting to provide feedback. Uh, Lucy, can I, can I say something? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, regarding the first one, as I mentioned in the chat box, like, you know, gender desegregation uh, or, you know, the different needs of the communities, how, how communities are actually reside in a particular area and what are their needs and how they are affected by the impact of climate change, particularly how they are exposed by the urban flooding. So that need uh, need to be documented, and the knowledge of exposure actually, uh, uh, you know, there with communities, and that is not actually, um, uh, you know, well documented by the government. If the government could validate those information from the community or from the community researchers, that could uh, contribute uh, in bottom up planning process. And that is, uh, you know, the demand-driven planning process. And uh, as many people actually said, that could contribute uh, in support decision-making system of the government. So that is one. The second one is uh, risk-sensitive risk land use planning uh, is a crucial uh, element uh, that the government should, you know, recognize in any settlement. So um, if the data uh, the community led data can be linked with those government led risk sensitive land use plan at the you know urban settlement or for the urban dwellers uh, that would help to validate uh, the uh, the crucial or pertinent need of the communities so these two uh, area uh, particularly link with bottom up planning and validation of the data and recognize the need of local community i stop Okay, thank you, Darren. Saranjana, did you have your hand up for uh, any last point or are you okay? I just put it in the chat. I thought oh, okay. that, uh, right. she, yeah, she, she talked about using the social tenure domain model to negotiate for communities that they should be, uh, they should have their drainage upgraded rather than being relocated. And that was something that they, they used their mapping to do. Wonderful. Well, Thank you very much to everybody for your to, to all of you for your participation for your your time and attention today. It's been for me it's been a, a really fascinating um, discussion. I think at the beginning we were uh, we were setting ourselves the challenge of um, uh, of seeing how that kind of uh, how innovation can be stimulated in terms of climate adaptation um, through collecting. Uh, lots of different tools that we've heard about for uh, community driven data and how that is crucial to this kind of uh, innovation and adaptation at the local level. We've heard about a range of different tools that people have been using. Um, 
we've heard about uh, uh, lots of mapping, um, digital tools, a blending of kind of on the ground things with uh, with, with with digital um, information. Um, we've <clears throat> we've also heard about um, how uh, organized communities, um, why that's really going to be important in terms of the future of uh, community-based adaptation. Uh, the future is urban. Many of the, our cities in the in, many of our cities are informal, um, with uh, huge, large percentages of the population facing so massive kind of uh, uh, climate risks and increasing risks. We need to harness the uh, innovation that comes from real-time community-driven uh, data and, and resources. But not only that, that that data needs to be owned by and held by communities so that it can be used in, in the very best way to stimulate that adaptation. There can be challenges in um, taking that information in, in taking that process up and scaling it up, but we need to get over the point that uh, we don't need to prove this time and again at the city level. This should become part of the mainstream way in which larger scale uh, funds can be disseminated and trickled down to the to the community levels so that they can uh, help to support the kinds of actions that uh, that communities know will have the biggest impact in helping them to adapt. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, we don't over-professionalize uh, an issue which communities know at, at, their, own, at their own level. Um, so I think it, it leaves uh, me just to pass back very briefly, Anne Wesher, if you would like to say any, any final words as, as we close and thank people, everybody for their participation, in particular, the, everybody who's uh, shared their stories today and, and been part of making this session uh, work. It's been, it's been great to hear your voices from all over the world. Thank you, Lucy. And I think uh, it was a very uh, enriching discussion, both in the plenary we heard from our different uh, uh, NGO, NGO practitioners and also the grassroots leader bringing in some of the interesting insights of their work. And also we, uh, we are hearing some of the very useful conversations from the breakout groups. I know the time was very short, but uh, I hope we ca continue having communication and interaction and uh, how better to strengthen community research process. So thank you everyone. And thank you for joining us for this session today.